Buenas noches. Gracias primero a todos por asistir a lo que es la última conferencia de la serie de arquitectura y crítica que comenzó con Fulvio Irache, Yuhani Palasma, William Curtis y, y hoy acaba con Jacques Kubler. Jacques Kubler es un arquitecto suizo, <coughs> arquitecto y doctorado por la Universidad de Lausanne, conocido fundamentalmente por su labor de crítico y de escritor, crítico en Casabella y profesor en universidades americanas como el Instituto de Tecnología de New Jersey, el Instituto de Arquitectura y Teoría e Historia Crítica en Lausanne y recientemente en el Politécnico de Lausanne y en la Academia de Arquitectura de Mendricio. Es un honor para nosotros tener esta noche a Jacques Hubler y por, no solo por esta conferencia, sino por el tiempo que pasa con nosotros y con los estudiantes y alumnos del Compostela Summer Program. Thank gracias. You. Thank you. Gracias. gracias, Carlos. Uh, well, I'm afraid I'll have to speak English. I hope you're going to help me. First of all, I'd like to thank not only Carlos, but also Oscar, who helped me and... <laughs> I had the good fortune to meet Oscar when he was, you know, one of these um, exchange students with the Erasmus connection came to Mendrisio. Uh, also, I may thank my colleagues because I followed the lectures, and um, my feeling is that I'm learning a lot, also from uh, the students and. Um, from the critiques, the wonderful critiques I followed, uh, yes, with Antonio. So it's a cultural shock for me because it's the first, my first time in Santiago, and I, I do feel, uh, in a way, you might say, displaced. Also, I must thank the students because uh, I'm trying to learn a few words for them, Particularly, uh, one of my one and only loves in life, reinforced concrete, and I want to learn to say reinforced concrete in Chinese. Gan Jin, Gan Jin Wan Tong, Gan Jin Wan Tong, no. Yeah, yeah. Gang Jin Huan in Tong. Huan in Tong. Ah, you should help me. Uh, there, there was a, a lot of confusion here in, in my cabbage. In my cabeth, I mean, my cabbage. Uh, And as you say in Serbo Croatian, there was a qui pro quo because uh, I was going to, to bring a lecture on this argument nationalism, internationalism in modern architecture in Switzerland. But it happened that my, my discs were corresponding to, to another research which has been published, and you find that now this Jean Chumet architecture at full scale. So since uh, you had this confusion in my suitcase, I'm going to use these discs. And there are going to be three parts in that talk. The first part is a general introduction to Jean Chumet's architecture. The second will be a case study on a building it did at Vevey, the headquarters of Nestlé. And the third part is going to be a, a film which documents the, the building at Vevey. So there is an enormous mass of documents which arrived suddenly, well, suddenly. It was about 10 years ago at Lausanne at the Polytechnical School where uh, I was responsible for the beginning and the development of an archive, 
I made the catalogue of that form, well, the show me papers, you might say. I found uh, various themes in architecture just from looking at such materials. And I'm, one of the themes is related to his love, but what I call the full scale. Why should he draw details at full scale? This is one of his obsessions. We're trying to ask a few of these questions. He was fortunate enough when being a student at the Beaux-Arts in Paris to meet a sculptor there called Edouard Marcel Sandeau, who is specialized in animal sculpture. And this man became one of Chumi's friends. He was also uh, one, <clears throat> well, you might, one of the CEO, chief executive officer of a chemical firm in Switzerland. And through uh, the in introduction of Sando, Chumi was lucky enough to meet, uh, well, many Swiss industrialists, in particular the people uh, working under the name of Nestle. So this connection is important because I think uh, if you understand a building, you first always have to say, who is the, you might say, the client? The client? Yeah, the patron, you might say. And in this case, this is the answer. Sando was a sculptor. He was also a voyageur. Um, and there it is with it was a strange man because he was a double formation. I mean, he was a capitalist, yes. He was a scientist. Uh, he was also a sculptor. And uh, he was crazy about white animals. Uh, one of his wishes in life was to transform the color of animals. He was improving with chemicals. He wanted uh, to grow red pigeons. He tried to do so, and he succeeded in a way. As you, you might have uh, seen, well, some of these flamingos are pink, provided they eat pink color. And this is what Sando left after Jean Chiumi's dying, death. Um, and this, these are uh, three of uh, Sando's sculpture in front of the headquarters of Sando at Orléans. I'm going to talk about themes in architecture. What is a theme in architecture? It's something of an obsession according to the definition given by Oswald Matthias Ungers. You, as architect, are supposed to develop obsessions, and these obsessions you will never leave. They will accompany you all through your life, whatever your age. You might be a young architect, you might be an old architect. You will keep your obsessions. So as far as Chumi is concerned, we'll have this obsession or this theme of architecture at full scale, scale one to one, échelle grandeur, as one says in French. Then another theme is uh, what I call the postage stamp. I mean, uh, the sketch at a very small scale, the scale of a postage stamp. And then another obsession is the variant, is unable, as we shall see, to think of a project without developing a series of variants. Now, how is he going to use this variant, particularly in, in a, a point which I will call strategy of seduction in front of the client? Corporate architecture, uh, this is a theme which wasn't so present in Europe at least until the 1950s and 1960s. We shall try to understand how the architect is able to develop um, a corporate architecture in relationship with the idiosyncrasies of its clients. If you work for IBM, it's not the same as working for Nestle, for instance. Uh, now, we shall see that Chumi is a man on the building side, and that he has a double formation, not only as an architect, he went to the Beaux-Arts in Paris, but also he studied at the School and Institute of Urbanism in Paris. And we 
we shall meet him at Stockholm and we shall see what he's doing about a, a project it was Paris Souterrain the extension of the city of the metropolis of Paris is underground immediately uh, before World War II now uh, I'm, I'm just going to show you a few works he did at Lausanne before closing uh, this first part of the program We don't need that light, but no, you want it? Oh well. Well, this is a flagpole. It's on tracing paper. It was meant to be at the mast of the Nestlé Pavilion at the World Fair in Paris, 1937. Uh, it's quite an impressive drawing when you see the original, because it measures uh, something like two meters. Chumi's father was a uh, cabinet maker. He was uh, producing furniture. And this is one of the reasons why his son, who worked with his father, was accustomed himself to work in full scale because scale one-to-one -one is the usual scale used uh, when you are a carpenter and want to, to build a stool, a chair, an armchair, and obviously a carpet. And this is a carton, or a carton for a carpet. And this uh, you develop at scale one to one before it comes to the process of weaving. So there is a, a regular logical evolution from the fact that before becoming, before studying architecture, he was working with his father near Lausanne um, at building furniture. So before World War I, he was born in Geneva in 1904, and then the father moved to Lausanne because there were more opportunities to work there than ever in Geneva. So you might say that the son went on, you see, in the track of following his father's examples, and it's very common uh, in these dynasties of uh, where practitioners that the son should, you see, become more important than the father. And I'm talking about dynasty because uh, probably you heard about Bernard. Bernard, Bernard, you say, in New York, or Bernard, you say, in Paris is Jean Chumet's son. Um, but Bernard didn't exactly follow uh, his father's wish. In fact, when his father died, Bernard didn't yet know he was going to study architecture. This is an ashtray, it's a very common piece of furniture. The ashtray was part of the furniture at that time. Well, you might have seen Miss smoking his cigar. This is an uncommon ashtray uh, because it's one of the directors of Sando and it's one of the military people in the Swiss army and they are related to uh, this idea of the sword. But it's also a very elaborate exercise in the use of metals. And um, th the foot... Uh, of this ashtray is loaded, is loaded with um, well these grains of metal of lead, which made it such that uh, this ashtray never well moves in such a way that ashes fell onto the carpet. This is fairly strange because it's a study for a cornice in reinforced concrete. It's um, yes, I think it's it's studied at full scale and it's related to the attic, the sixth floor of this um, labs, Sando at Orléans. You and there you you have uh, the combination of 
the variation, you might say, of the sketch is a very small scale. This is a detail of the attic. And this is a good pond art. This is the phenomenon. How are you going to cope with the rain? It's a joke. It is a joke. And his um, dessinateur, well, he was using for, for in his office in Paris, as well as on his second office in Lausanne, his best students to do his office work. And this drawing has been done by one of his students. And this is, you might say, a caricature of the boss, of the patron. That was the word they used in French. Now, coming to his formation in Paris, he was um, uh, integrated, or he chose to, to go into uh, Jean Pontremoli's atelier. No, Emmanuel, sorry, Emmanuel Pontremoli's atelier. And he was constantly were participating in two inner competitions. So to get this first medal, the Concours Rougevin, it's an annual competition they had at the school in Paris, the program itself was the study um, of a postage stamp. And what did he choose? He chose to combine some of the main monuments making or building the silhouette in Paris, whether uh, you might say modern or ancient buildings. And the, the, the top of the cupola is the presence here uh, you, you probably know this building. Hmm? It's the Pantheon. Now, it's very impressive to, to look at the concentration of the intensity. Uh, the, we, we, we find simultaneously the use of the variant. It's a study for an armchair. It's very small. Um, Shumiche chose the example or followed the advers given to him by one of his masters, um, his master was called Jacques-Emile Roulman. Roulman was a cabinet maker. He, he, he was producing in his atelier, in his shop, furniture. Uh, he's one of the leaders of the Art Deco movement. Roulman's success first came into existence, into being into international notoriety during the 1925 exhibition in Paris. And Ruhlmann was telling his students, now, please, no, try to concentrate your attention uh, into the small, the very small scale, because this is where you're going to capture the greatest intensity in, f in the study of uh, the project. And once you found this is typical of the Art Deco of the uh, no, what it's Art Deco is leading to what you might call this streamlining now uh, once you've selected your variant are you going to develop it at full scale so you, from the intensity of a small sketch, you go to the full scale, and it's constant movement of, you might say, zooming. But the, the strange thing about Shumi is that when he's developing an architectural project, in this case, it's going to be a competition for a veterinary medicine hospital in the University of Zurich, is doing exactly the same to find what is called uh, the parti which is the, the way you're going to treat the various parts of the program into a whole. So the, uh, he's studying this at small scale, using the, the so-called, well, um, this, this is Roman's word, well, postage stamp technique, and studying uh, what is going to develop in, in order to participate into this competition. And there is an enormous... Uh, Intensity, not only, but I would say beauty uh, on these uh, sketches. And the frame frame is generally, uh, I know many architects who wouldn't keep these as documents in their archive, but there are thousands 
I'm not kidding when I'm saying thousands of such documents which have been kept by the architect. Why did he keep it? Because they thought, I, I, I might want to refer to that when it comes to uh, another commission, and so I'm going to gain time. Or I might want to give this um, sketch or this idea to one of my collaborators, and he's going to develop it, and I'm going to go back and see what, what he's doing. So he has kept everything. I know that Luigi Nazi, for instance, well, always eliminates this kind of nonsense for him, for Snotsi. But this is full of sand for Chumi. And what I've, I'm friendly with these people from Barcelona, Esteban Bonnell and Josa Maria Gilles, um, and they're practicing you know, along the same technique, mixing the various scales. Uh, these are sketches for a library in Lerida. They didn't win that competition. So it's a coincidence, you might say, in a way. There is a lot of, in, of precision uh, in such a drawing. Uh, and you, you see the relationship between the furniture and the cornice or the configuration of the building. This portico is like... A <laughs> a table within the library. Well, it's a coincidence, uh, and this is purely empirical, and I was glad to find um, this in Chumi because uh, I developed the research on Chumi after meeting Bonnel and Gilles, and, and the two things were uh, growing together. Now we arrive to this idea of another theme in architecture is the practice of the variant. Uh, we are in Geneva in 1960. It's a competition for the World Health Organization, Organisation Mondiale de la Santé. And within the office, within Jean Chumis office, he opens a competition between uh, his various collaborators. With the, I'm not going to enter in, uh, in detail into this program, which it, it's a building in a park. Uh, it, it has a big auditorium, which you might see here. This is one solution. This is, would be another solution. It has a secretary, which is going to be permanent, and it has to secure offices at the the moment uh, of, the, of the yearly uh, gatherings and discussions. Two hands, two different hands. The competition is open inside the office. And this is very interesting. Uh, north is here, but now during the night you have the patron is coming and is looking at the work of, of his door and what is he doing? And he, now suppose you, you combine your plan like this, so this is what you're going, you're going to and because this is Jean Chumi's hand so are you, are you conscious that drawing so you're going to build such a configuration. Uh, very quickly, uh, is, uh, Emmanuel Pontremoli, is, he chose this atelier, um, and this atelier was famous for the virtuosity of its uh, rendering, and Chumi was a virtuose, was definitely a painter. One of the questions uh, I ask is this habit of the variant, is it part of Pontremoli's teaching or is it a personal habit? I'm, I'm not sure if I can give a true answer to that, but my feeling is that Pontremoli very much wanted his students to develop variant. This is a, uh, a precise site at the Place de la République in Paris, and the program is the, the seat... Uh, of a big administration, could be a bank, for instance. 
and the same for the facades. This is a variant. You see? Oh, I could develop, but look at the windows or look at the uh, order of the pilasters. They're, they are different, or the treatment uh, of the there, ground floor in relation to the mezzanino. Now, what about corporate architecture? This is the moment when Nestle's headquarters in Vevey are inaugurated. This is one of the two directors. He's looking like a true butcher. The others are politicians. And this is one of the first opportunities for Chumi to, to try to create an image. Uh, you might call this architecture parlante. You might have heard about that in relationship to the work of somebody like uh, Le Doux. This is the true illustration of the main, you might say, preparation of Nestlé. It was not chocolate. No, it was flour. Yes, farine lactée. It was literally milk flour. It was a synthetic, um, well, element, nourishment uh, of the babies. Um, the logo is the idea of the the small nest nest. Yes, nest in German means, what does it mean, nest? Like in English. And Nestle literally means little nest. It was the name of a German industrialist and chemist who, who came to Switzerland to develop uh, his patents. It was a later incident that um, such uh, flour, milk, powder was introduced into chocolate and to make mm, smoother than, uh, you know, black chocolate. Uh, so what underneath the cylinder? Well, you had this cupola. It's the world panorama. And this is a very dynamic process. It's a spiral, turns. Um, well, it was built during that exhibition of Art et Technique, 1937 in Paris. It was a first contact. It was leading to other opportunities for Chumi to build for these people of the, well, food industry or chemical industry. I told you about the use of the variant. Uh, he was fortunate enough to be commissioned for the whole of the furniture. He was talking to one of the directors. This Enrico Bignami uh, was an Italian born. Uh, <coughs> one of the two directors of Nestle. And said, Now, Mr. Bignami, you have a choice between this and that. What do you prefer? Binyami chose that. Now, Binyami uh, identified himself with Chumi's design because of that. He had the feeling that uh, I'm going to decide um, the way the architect is going to treat and organize the program. Of course, in Chumi's strategy, the main decisions about the structure, about the composition of about the organization of the plan was his. But it did left open some, well, variant. This is the French world. And so it did also with the people of, of Sando. It was his first commission was for this building in Basel. And there you see his way of using seduction one of the directors, his office. Do you want this or do you want that? Oh, you want this set of color or this set of color? 
Uh, it was, um, I would say, clever enough also to leave space and room for his colleague Sandu, who was the, the sculptor, to add his own beauty to the furniture of that council room. We're going to see a Chumi at work, and he's a man on the building place. He has an enormous interest uh, in the, the technical fabrication and the use of the various material, and in particular, Ganjin Huang Tong. Ganjin Huang Tong. Yes. Yeah, all together. Ganjin won. Ganjin We might improve in a, in a, in a few minutes, you know. It's a very impressive big piece of prefabrication, uh, 1955, within uh, a frame, the first frame building this facade, this the western gable. He introduces these heavy prefabricated elements with the geometrical game of a frame within a frame. This, uh, the picture was taken for the man who was <laughs> moving the crane. And this is a completely other program. It's a grain silo. You know, one of these containers, you, know, you, you pump the corn at the top of the building, and the corn is introduced into various compartments. And by gravity, you can empty such compartments. It was a surprise to discover here a conversation between the architect and the contractor. This is a very clever and very elegant building. I'm using the word elegant. I don't know about your perception of the word elegant as far as architecture is concerned. If you do consider or not that elegant is required or that elegant is a positive word or is elegant for elegance in architecture is it necessary is it positive is it negative on the contrary what's your feeling about it about the elegance hmm? Because you might say, I want to be essential. If you are essential, you don't need to be elegant. You, you can be crude. You can be rough. But maybe you don't need to be. I don't know about it. But uh, Shumi was perceiving this ideal elegance, you might say. He did use the word and his architecture does in a certain way show elegance which might be related to this strategy of seduction he's using in front of his clients. What about the word elegance? Shall we make a test? Say, uh, who thinks that elegance uh, is a plus in architecture. Who? Elegant? Nobody. Oh, good. Well, well. So, you, elegance is, is rather minus for you. But what do you think? Are you going to be elegant uh, in your sketches? Uh, no? Or oh, maybe it's not a good question. Or maybe you tell me on Thursday. Hmm? 
an attitude, you said. Oh. Well, thank you for this answer. I mean, some architects have tried, I'm thinking of Adolf Loos, of making relationship between uh, the way you dress yourself and uh, as, as part of your identity and, and, and the way you're using the materials. But that would be maybe another lecture. It's another lecture about... Uh, the, what? Yes? What What did you say? Yes. Yo. No debería consumir eh, excesos. Debería ser una cosa pura. Es sin sería elegante en la arquitectura. También, también debería ser como esto, elegante, pura, sin excesos. ¿Sí? Now the question will be, uh, when I'm going to show you the building, it, Jumi built at, uh, at Vevey for Nestlé, if you think this is elegant or not, For instance, this is the way is building uh, the portico. Because the building uh, is a portico of reinforced concrete. It's a very elaborate reinforced concrete treated as a sculpture. And then he has a steel frame on six levels which is put on this portico. Uh, it's a fairly intricate way of preparing um, Technically, also, it's pre part of it is pre-stressed. Um, he, he was constantly working with very, very uh, with talented engineers, and particularly two of them. Uh, and this is an example of uh, Alexandre Sarrazin's work in reinforced concrete. Sarraza is, is very well known for the inf invention, uh, and you might say again, elegance of his bridges or the technical solutions he took. Maybe it's not apparent for people who use of the building, it's certainly apparent for people who take pictures of such buildings. This is the way he's testing or they, because you have two engineers here, one for the reinforced concrete and the other for um, the, the steel frame, they are testing the building at scale one to one, you might say. They have started to do so with a mock-up. The practice of the mock-up uh, has developed at that moment um, there again, the picture is taken from the top of one of the cranes. We're facing the lake towards south. And, and you have this uh, strange haze, which is typical of uh, what's happening in, in winter. Uh, they have even to work in winter, because um, well, the two directors are in a terrible hurry, as we shall see through the film. Now, let us come to this competition. He was very young. It was, he had finished he, his studies uh, at Paris, at pont -Rémoli. He was taking part into this competition for the master plan at the center of Stockholm in 1932. It was a, an important competition. Uh, over 250 offices, uh, from not only from Europe, but also from the United States, South America, take part into this competition. Um, and there, he starts using 
this idea in reference to, of course, the images. Uh, this is 1922, and you recognize uh, one of the proposal for uh, Le Corbusier, Ville Contemporaine, three million inhabitants. This he had studied when uh, st uh, he was at the Institut d'Urbanisme, uh, this idea of the central axis between uh, the, where he's going to, to put um, l'autopista. Hmm? But it's strange that he should well, come to use this technique of the postage stamp to study the different variants. Well, almost, uh, this is rather funny, no, funny, I don't know, maybe um, it's interesting that you think you are in a plane now and you're flying over the city. The way uh, when architects have started to use this vision of the city from the plane, it completely changed the perception of the territory. And this happened around World War I. You, I'm sure you cannot talk about the landscape even if you walk, even if you, you take the Camino, uh, without relating to what you know of the territory from what you have seen from a plane. It's impossible. Uh, you know you're going to decipher the geography from a plane if, if you know what the different the techniques in agriculture are. Okay, if you, you, there are some states in the United States where you find the presence of a grid. Now, uh, if you fly over Virginia, yet you see is they have copied the, te the agricultural techniques uh, of England. And this you see uh, from the plane itself. And this is the way uh, Chumi concentrates his um, attention on this competition. Uh, it's the, roughly the north-south axis. And this is the center, the, the, the royal palace, which is the central building, which, which you see here on this island. Uh, there are. I told you thousands of s such small sketches on tracing paper. Now, this is also interesting because uh, it's a trace of what? Yes. One, one of its fags from the cigarettes have fallen upon the paper. And so the, the paper was burnt, and there are also hundreds of such traces um, in his material. Um, he was constantly smoking. Uh, his son used at Christmas to give him a box of 200 cigarettes. Uh, New Year, had, he had, everything had been smoked. Yeah. Uh, the son has told me that. Uh, so maybe he wasn't uh, smoking when he, when he went to bed and, and slept. But, uh, and his students had to smoke. You could not be an architect without smoking at that time. Yeah. Uh, this one I particularly like because it's almost like looking through a hublot. And this is one of the themes, uh, of course, in Le Corbusier. Now, in this competition, there is a, a lot of variant because uh, he refers not only to the project of Ville Contemporaine, but also... Uh, to another uh, theoretician it's called Hilbersheimer, we shall see this in a while. And there, in this competition, is going to not give just one. You were supposed, yes, to draw your sketch as a um, photo composition, but two. And is going to be eliminated in the first round. Oh, this is utopian. We don't need that. And he was very proud of that elimination because Le Corbusier had been eliminated for the same reason. This is utopia. We don't want this. So, 
central axis, one first foreground is the Rouen Palace, and uh, some of the buildings are maintained as well, signs in the territory, like the church or the park. The, the grid pre-existed you know, from the end of the 17th century. This is one of the other references, which is Hilbersheimer, and uh, he knew that book. That book was in his personal library. Uh, this is one of these vision of Paris at night, American bars, <laughs> La Coupole. Uh, you know, it's one of the uh, well-known cafe brasserie. We are at Montparnasse, and a lot of stories about, uh, well, different artists, poets, painters, spending time and time on La Coupole. Um, this is a, it is a, a sketch, a perspective edit for Pontremoli. It's dated 28, it might be 29, I don't know. Um, there is a French expression, entre chien et loup, between dogs and wolves, this kind of strange light there is and the, it's not dark yet but it's not night yet uh, we are well, between dogs and wolves and this is the kind of light you know, it's a very you might say pictorial drawing charcoal thing uh, the speed is there, part of the poetics, maybe also of the drawing. Now, imagine that there was a group of uh, architects, not only in France, but particularly in Paris, but not only, who were thinking about the future of the metropolis being underground. Um, and this plan was submitted to the reflection uh, of the public, you know, as they said, in 1937 at that uh, World Exhibition. And Chumé was responsible for the construction of this model where he used uh, neon tubes of different colors in superposition of the various networks. So the, the ultimate networks to be added, now uh, you might see, does correspond also to, well, this is Bois de Vincennes, for instance, still there. Well, this is a well known Montmartre and Sacre Coeur. Uh, there are already networks there, like uh, the Metro or the Sewers. This is more, much more radical. Well, how is it possible to think? in a utopian way, that the future of the metropolis was to be underground. This sketch was discovered, was it uh, ten days before the opening of the, the exhibition? Um, <coughs> it shows you uh, the colors of this model because they w only have black and white pictures for that and the son was particularly moved because he thought uh, he was doing the same himself the moment the, 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 the arbitrary so this is not an arbitrary superposition of networks but Bernard said he was when he won his first competition at La Villette proceeding along the same uh, way without knowing it. Uh, and to finish, uh, this is a proposal he did for uh, an exhibition, a national exhibition, which was taking place at Lausanne in, in, in 64. But uh, nothing was... And there again, um, the 300 meters tower in reinforced concrete with Alexandre Sarraza, Nothing came out of that because he died in the night train between um, Paris and Lausanne. 
He had an office in Lausanne, an office in Paris. He, he developed the school at Lausanne. And um, I have a friend uh, who's a painter and architect in Leuven. And he's practicing a technique of watercolor, what I like to call critical nostalgia. Um, I told him about my interest in Chumi and the fact that uh, people from Nestle, his customers, were, were organizing, you might say, well, field trips or voyage d'études to go and study uh, what the architecture of the United States, not only in uh, Manhattan, but the, the way uh, these pharma uh, companies were organized uh, mostly in uh, New England and uh, near Washington and in New Jersey, which is one of these states where the farm industry is very important. And they were copying, uh, interpreting, because to copy is to interpret not only the constructive systems like the use of aluminium, but uh, the corporate habit of these companies like, uh, you're not going to stop to work at 12 o'clock and start again at 2 o'clock. Now, you're going to stay and have a, a meal in 20 minutes, and you have a pause of three times 20 minutes, and you have the self-service, which is now incorporated uh, into your presence uh, during a full uh, time of production um, within uh, the, ad the headquarters of Nestlé talking about this example. The constellation was, uh, well, the plane which covered uh, all the, the beauty of the, well, aluminium, plastic, and what else, well, streamlining. And it, it became as poetically, and, um, very much as Charles Eames' furniture, an example to be emulated by Chumi, and this is a, a chapter which you might find in the book. It's called about Americanism. He uh, was trying to use Charles and Ray Eames and Harry Bertoia. This is Bertoia, for instance, and his own furniture. The building uh, finished at Vevey, uh, we say an award, an important award given by the American aluminium industry. It was the, the so called uh, Reynolds Prize. And now I'd like to switch. Let me try to be clever. It's not very easy. Uh, oh well. No. What I'm trying to do is to find a second program. What shall I do? Can you uh, uh, me? Oh well. Oscar's coming. Uh, Oh, yeah, that is this. Thank you. Yes, yeah, that's the one. <coughs> but this is a, a wonderful portrait. It's difficult to find a, a portrait of Chumi where it doesn't uh, wear, I'm going to say, wear a cigarette in his hands. And even um, when he, at school, when he's drawing on the blackboard, he holds the chalk as if it would be a cigarette. The picture was taken in 1960, immediately after the Reynolds Award. So we have the two dates. Um, the lecture is divided in 
four parts. Well, seduction and use of the variant. A man on the building site. And then I'm going to do a comp- the paragone, one says, a, compris- a comparison with the UNESCO building in Paris by Zerfus. There is an emulation between them because Zerfus was a friend, Chumi's friend at Pontremolise. And when Zerfus was building the UNESCO in Paris, Chumi was building uh, the Nestlé's headquarter in Vevey. And, well, this is the, the final success you, uh, we're going to reach before launching the movie. So these are uh, what Nestlé themselves, Time magazine reportage called. These, these people are butchers. And Nestlé formed them and sent them into the world. Then they come back and they give their life practically for the sake of this company. No, the, these are the local politicians typically behaving like Swiss local politicians. They also, you know, they're not butchers in this case, they're peasants who say, oh, you don't know, I can tell you, I'm a peasant. Now, this is this famous plan. I'm going to call this an epsilon, you might say, away. And uh, it takes the place of the, of the former hotel, which was here, it was the Grand Hotel, which accounts for the, the presence of a pre-existent landscape. It's not only here the harbor, but also um, the trees in this park, which are going to be maintained. Um, the city of Vevey had um, an idea of selling uh, in diff- various uh, plots and having a quarter of a villa, but Nestlé bought the whole, and then uh, they built this headquarters. Uh, um, I could talk about the contractors, the to play a very important role in my scene in the movie. Two engineers, Sarraza, who is a specialist in going, jing, horn, tour. Please. What? Gong, gong, jing, horn, tour. No, maybe you say it better than I do. Gandhi. One. Ton. Oh, I'm sorry, you don't help me very much. You leave me alone. I'm not very pleased. And we have to talk about the architects, and I'm going architects in the plural because. Uh, Nestlé has hired a local architect to follow uh, exactly what's happening uh, on the building place day after day. Um, they're working in, in... Chumi is going just once a week. But then it, it was possible, looking at the archives also, to find at least these three... Dro- Dessinateur, you might say. They're, they were all pupils by Chumi and the school in Lausanne. And they were still alive. And each of them uh, has put his initials, so LV for Leopold Veuve, uh, on the tracing paper. And this is Bullmann. He is responsible as an architect for the quantification of the program. It's a very important how big is the thing going to be? And these were, I will play a few, they, they require a headquarters with an office building for um, 1,500 uh, 1, people. Uh, these figures you, you might be unimportant, but what is very, very important is the fact that uh, the overall price shouldn't exceed 40 million of Swiss francs. 
And in, it's exactly uh, even uh, to me saved well not very much but two million he might have spent two more million he didn't because in front of the uh, these people who are businessmen the two directors were following week after week month after month uh, what the architect was spending and sometimes they they question the price uh, even uh, they said that no, we're not going to pay so much for your engineer and reinforced concrete. So he developed a strange technique in seduction because this is a collage. It's, it's literally pieces of, of cardboard. Uh, they give you a simulation in perspective of this brise soleil, for instance. This is going to be built in aluminium, but now, um, it's, but this is necessary in order to enter into contact with these two directors. Well, like all uh, civilians, you might say, they understand perspective rather than a section or plans. And this technique is fairly strange. Uh, it's unprecedented. I haven't seen it a second time. Now, the architect asked the director, you know, the, the direction, had, where do you want to have it? Are you, uh, do you want it at the bel etage, the second floor? And you have this small protruding box. It's going to be the expression of, the, of your offices. You say, oh, no, 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 no. We don't want to appear. First, we want to be in the middle. So let us put us on the third, third floor. And they're going to be here. And we don't want to be in the attic. Because the, the, the attic is too beautiful for us. We, we want to share the view with... Uh, our collaborators, uh, um, our personnel. Hmm? We'll have the attic over there. Because the, I know well, Philip Morris headquarters at Lausanne, uh, they, they, they had a wolf. Director was a playboy, so he had his uh, small playboy apartment in the attic. Uh, This is a proposal in variant for the location of the director's headquarters on the second floor. They don't want that. These are awful drawings. Um, no, they're, the, they're not by Chumi himself. It's but one of the most brilliant uh, collaborator. This, again, perspective, I'll show you that. Do you want to your office to look like this or like that. Oh, well, we rarely have it blue. And the same systematically. This is uh, the boardroom. Um, this is the waiting room. From facade to facade, now you see the naked steel structure. And everything is going to be furnished decorated. It all starts with uh, this kind of, of moment of destruction of the Grand Hotel. This is the justification for the party, is that uh, you can combine everything uh, within this Epsilon. You, you'll notice that what's happening in Paris is quite different because this is a dovetail. It's not an orthogonal structure. No, it's a dovetail. It might make it more elegant. Everything is recuperated because they're transforming the landscape.
This is the uh, underground garage with natural light, and above this, the platform. This is exactly what it is. It's a platform, Portico, and the horizon will be the lake. Uh, Portico on the platform. See, picture taken uh, in the winter before the most you see in the film the the workers are coming from Italy this is the horizon only it's hazy and you might imagine there's a lake there this is part of the pre-stressing of the platform and now on that platform what do you, we have we have this frame and this frame uh, is steel it's painted red the, the ceilings are going to be poured within the aluminium form so that uh, the form for the concrete of the ceilings is part of the structure. It's a, it's a patent which was developed in the United States. It's a very expeditive process. If uh, the steel structure is the form for pouring the concrete, you gain time. This is the geometry of the underground garage. This was quite an innovation at that time in Switzerland. Also the strange fact that uh, the architect wanted to bring the light into the underground garage, which not very many architects wants to do so. I think some have done so in, in Santiago. And you see that there, the road going underneath, or there, there's a service road, follow the geometry of the curve. That part of the building is symmetrical. The two ales here are not. Another interesting thing here is that in this attic, you have a suspended garden. It was one of the prescriptions the municipality of the city of Vevey had given. In this part of, of you, you, you should have a lower building. You understand all this better in section, the elaborate portico with this kind of geometry, the central corridor, the lateral distribution. This is the, the projection of the geometry of the portico. Uh, this kind of canopy. The double staircase you'll find here. Rainforest concrete treated as a sculpture, but for that, it was a very elaborate plan d'armature. The dovetails. It was very proud of this um, corrugated sheets. It was a, a technique used, uh, of course, in, in, in aircraft industry. It opens like a, as you say, abanico. How do you say in English? Abanico. Yes, a fan, yes. Uh, one of the pictures taken with the Kodachrome 1960, uh, the, 
geometry of the ceiling on its projection in the pavement. Um, look at the armchairs or look at double staircase in aluminium. It was well, quite an accomplishment. I don't know if you can use the word uh, virtuoso. Is virtuosity part of architecture? I don't know. I have seen here in Santiago there is even a treble. Not only a double spiral, but you might say a treble spiral. Not not far from here, which is an incredible staircase. You should all go and see. There it's the museum in front of Caesar's building. It's a way of controlling uh, the non-mixture of the of the people. That people going to the second floor shouldn't mean people going to the third floor. No, it's not the case in Vevein, but it's probably the case here. Now, there is a fight about this picture because uh, the son wanted the picture to be published like that, whereas it was taken from heaven down to the earth. He thought it would be much more beautiful to have it I'm thinking like <sighs> this is how the picture should be taken. This is how the sun wants it to be seen. Um, this is the attic garden. And it's it's part of the leisure the, um, the people can do during the after or before the meal, after the meal, depending on the 20 minutes you want to pick up for your lunch. This is the wonderful cross-section published by uh, one of the engineers, the engineer responsible for the steel construction. And now we enter into this comparison with the building by Zerfus. Of course, it was published under the name of Breuer and Nervi. You know, Nervi uh, is the Italian engineer from Torino, a specialist in reinforced concrete. Now, there is an emulation, because Zerfus is a, one of um, uh, Chumi's good friends. They studied together at Pontremoli. And it is an emulation. Some of the... Uh, de- now, the reason why you find an Ypsilon here is completely different. It's a contextual building. Uh, we're in the axis of the Eiffel Tower. You find here, here the Ecole Militaire. Yes. And these buildings do exist with the Place de Fontenoy. So this is a very clever way of, of uh, being in context, closing uh, the square and opening towards the park. The auditorium here is separated from uh, the secretary building, which you find here, where we have seen that the building uh, in Vevey is, a, is an object, is a sculpture in a park. Again, the building in Paris is, is symmetrical. Here, you can see, you see it's the way it's orthogonal here. Also, it's, it's very, you might say, brutal. It doesn't want to be elegant.
We know uh, Chumi went on the spot, visited uh, the building during uh, its construction. And they're entirely different. Again, a comparison between uh, the two situations. Uh, you see the Reynolds Orwood, 25000 Dollar in 1960. Hmm. He has to fly to California where the Reynold industry is situated. The reason uh, why he was awarded the prize was a novative value, potassium, aluminium. This prize no longer exists, but um, this prize was directed, you might say, uh, by Gropius. He was the president of the jury. And it was organized every year. It was quite a success because uh, there was something like 30, 35 candidates in 1916. Well, just the beauty of the picture. There again, uh, the Americanism, uh, this inter integration of, you might say, I don't know, elegance, speed, streamlining into architecture in Europe. Uh, this again, this might call streamlining. And these are the ladies waving at us and thanking you for being so attentive to well, the poor things I was trying to tell you and now you know, try to be clever another time I don't know maybe I should ask Oscar uh, or maybe I can do it Now, the problem is how you're going to document a building. I, w I tried to promise my colleagues and um, students that I would try to. You cannot be an historian, an architectural historian, without talking the history of, on, of the building on the building place, on the site. 23 avril 1960, Vevey, no, no. inauguration du centre administratif Nestlé, no, he, concrétisant he, he, toutes he, les he, lignes de force de l'architecture moderne. L'auteur de cet événement architectural, le professeur Jean Tchoumi, recevait à cette occasion une distinction rare, le Reynolds Memorial Award, et expliquait les raisons de l'attribution de ce prix. Les Américains ont été intéressés surtout par toutes les nouveautés de l'utilisation de l'aluminium dans le bâtiment. No, no, but uh, this we don't know. You, you should. Vingt-trois avril 1960, Vevey, inauguration du centre administratif Nestlé, concrétisant toutes les lignes de force de l'architecture moderne. L'auteur de cet événement architectural, le professeur Jean Tchoumi, recevait à cette occasion une distinction rare, le Reynolds Memorial Award, et expliquait les raisons de l'attribution de ce prix. Les Américains ont été intéressés par toutes les nouveautés de l'utilisation de l'aluminium dans le bâtiment. En particulier pour la marquise d'entrée, cette marquise d'entrée avec 11 mètres de porte-à-faux, avec de simples tôles et de légers profilés, est exceptionnelle de conception et de réalisation. Les Américains ont été intéressés également pour tout ce qui concerne les bris de soleil. Et cette utilisation leur a semblé une nouveauté et pense qu'elle peut faire évoluer la conception de l'aluminium dans les façades de l'architecture en jeu. Une déclaration permettant de comprendre comment tout commence. 
Trois ans plus tôt, le grand hôtel de Bebe vivait ses derniers instants. Acheté par l'entreprise Nestlé, le grand hôtel, vestige d'un luxe révolu, devait céder la place au nouveau centre administratif pour lequel le professeur Chumi avait conçu plusieurs maquettes, dont une en forme de Y, qui remporta l'adhésion générale. Curieux destin que celui des matériaux du grand hôtel, les tonnes de gravats de ce témoin de la rivière avaudoise de la Belle Époque, permettant finalement de combler les rives du lac et le port de la propriété d'antan. Seul subsisterait désormais le souvenir de cet édifice qui compta jusqu'à 140 chambres au temps de sa splendeur et qui connut nombre de vicissitudes durant son existence, servant notamment de logement pour les internés durant la guerre 39-45, avant d'être reconverti et que la présence en particulier dans ses murs des joueurs italiens lors de la Coupe du monde de football en 1954 ne suscita des bordées de sifflets d'un public survolté à l'issue d'un mémorable Suisse Italie. Dorénavant, les pierres du grand hôtel connaîtraient un destin plus calme, utilisé en particulier pour la création d'une digue et d'un chemin public propice à la promenade en bordure du lac. À cette époque déjà, les préoccupations de l'environnement existaient et l'implantation du nouveau centre administratif permettait de sauvegarder la majeure partie des arbres du parc le Y du bâtiment s'inscrivant dans les éléments naturels de la propriété. Avec les premières excavations du grand chantier proprement dit, l'architecte exécutait la phase de son programme prévoyant un volume de construction à implanter dans le terrain en tenant compte des contraintes imposées par le pourcentage d'occupation du sol sur l'ensemble de la propriété. Les bétonneuses et les grues de chantier apparaissaient à leur tour alors que s'édifiait le bureau maquette, un module expérimental destiné à étudier la charpente, les façades, les fenêtres et les faux plafonds, ainsi que les dalles constituées par des tôles ondulées reposant sur des charpentes métalliques. Les fondations proprement dites ne posaient pas de gros problèmes, le bâtiment étant construit au-dessus de la nappe phréatique et le sol étant de bonne qualité, constitué par du sable et des graviers alluvionnaires. À l'intérieur du coffrage en bois d'alors, le niveau de l'eau dans certaines fouilles était simplement abaissé par pompage continu. Si les coffrages de bois sont maintenant remplacés par des éléments métanniques, un autre changement important est intervenu depuis 1957 dans le bétonnage. Alors qu'aujourd'hui, le béton fabriqué en usine est apporté directement sur les lieux de travail, le chantier forain d'il y a quelques années encore voyait le béton fabriqué sur place avec ces bétonneuses qui appartiennent presque au passé. Durant des mois, l'activité fébrile du chantier se poursuivait et les structures de béton armé et de béton précontraint se développaient suivant les rythmes des travaux nécessitant... Perdonar, pero tenemos un tiempo limitado para uso auditorio y aunque el vídeo es muy interesante, quizás es más conveniente pasar. No, my my question was about this video. Is that the the only way you can do the the history of architecture is to 
try to think about uh, the history of the construction itself. And the only way to document that uh, is to use the, well, this medium, the film, the video, is the only way. So I'm uh, sorry that um, I didn't, I wasn't clever enough to, to respect uh, the, the time limit uh, we were given this evening because the, the film would have been interesting, starting with the demolition <laughs> of the Grand Hotel leading to the construction of a new building and the transformation of the landscape. So, uh, what's your idea now, uh, Carlos? You want to open a discussion? Or? Probably, dado la limitación de tiempo, lo más adecuado es abrir un turno de preguntas o cualquier cuestión que tengáis o la conferencia. Aprovechamos que está Jacques Culver con nosotros un poco más. Why don't you take the mic? You said that um, one of the best ways to teach history is to show the documentation through video. This last video you were showing, you said it's one of the best ways to teach history. I'm afraid I don't, I don't understand what you're telling me because the acoustic uh, makes it impossible for me to, to understand what you say. She's asking you the, way, the best way to teach history is to use the, me the media, the media, the media of the video. It's a challenge you know, to architectural history without the use of uh, the video and the documentation on the building site. I mean, it's one of the problems of the publication. I mean, the, suppose there is a competition, so you publish the first, second, third, fourth, fifth prize, and then you, you publish the building when it's finished. Now, what's happening between the two dates? This is, I think, fairly important. There are exceptions, of course. The most notable moment is the construction of Crystal Palace, London, well, 1950-51, because the, we have, uh, yes, weekly reports on the procedure. It's an event, Crystal, it's, a, it's exceptional. You might document the construction of the Eiffel Tower, but uh, this museum, for instance, is built, is used, we know it, we appreciate him, we, we love him. Are there any documents about the way it has been built, the excavation? I don't know. There are decisions taken during the building process. It's my feeling, but I know. What do you think? Well, what about um, today? Anyone can take a video of a building going up, and so how do you determine which, which buildings have value and which, which are not good? Yeah. 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 What about today? What is your answer? That was the question. Oh, your answer is a question, yeah. yeah.
Thank you, Jax. Thank you for all your time and your collaboration with us on this week. I hope to see you next year as well. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Carlos, for your nice invitation. And